Good afternoon, everybody. This is Bonnie Vandermullen, Training Coordinator for Wisconsin Facets. On behalf of our entire Wisconsin Facets staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Our webinar today is part of our Compassion Resilience Self-Care Snapshot Series, and this one is entitled Locus of Control. It's my pleasure today to introduce to you our presenter for today, Emily Jonesburg. Emily is the training lead with Rogers in Health, the Education and Advocacy Department of Rogers Behavior Health, and a proud mom of an active toddler. In her role at Rogers, she facilitates trainings for leaders in the nonprofit, education, and healthcare sectors. Emily also facilitates programming for staff at Rogers Behavior Health and with parents in the community. Prior to her work at Rogers, Emily worked in a youth serving capacity for over 13 years through various nonprofits and school districts. During this time, she has also developed and delivered equity training with adults and with youth. Emily has a master's of social work and is a licensed clinical social worker. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce to you Emily Jonesburg. Emily? Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks for the introduction and thanks to everyone out there for joining me today. It is a pleasure to be with you to continue our self-care snapshot series. And as was mentioned, I'm gonna be focusing on locus con of control and how it relates to compassion resilience. Before I jump into what that all entails, I'd like to take a moment just to pause. A lot of research shows and my own personal experience and anecdotes from other folks has proven that taking a moment just to pause and be in the moment can be a skill that really contributes to our compassion resilience and leaves us or can leave us feeling a little bit more whole. We have lots of things going on in our world right now that are there draining us, distracting us, everything from COVID and the pandemic to injustices in our community, civil unrest, to the everyday drains that we have of just existing in our world. And that can drain us over time. But right now, I want us just to take a moment to be present here together to learn and grow to be our best selves. So I'm gonna ask you to get into a comfortable position, whatever that means for you. For me, that's both feet on the ground, hands in my lap, back against the back of my chair. And then I'm gonna ask you to either close your eyes or just take them off the screen, give them a break from that screen for a moment. And ask you to check in with your body, starting with your breath. As you focus on your breath, take a moment just to slow it down. As we focus on slowing our breath down, also just bring attention to your body and the way in which it feels. Perhaps it's heavy against the seat you're sitting on. You can feel the weight relaxing into the earth as your feet touch the ground. Visualize your shoulders dropping. And as you continue to focus on slowing your breath, just give yourself a moment to focus in on something that brings you a sense of calm as well. Where are you? What kind of things could you see around you in that place that brings you calm? Do you have any people with you? Are you alone? And what kind of sounds would you hear, even smells would you smell? As you let your body sit in that place of calm, I want you to again bring your attention to your breath and just focus on two more slow breaths. Now I invite you to bring your attention back to our screen and our group together. 
thank you for that chance to pause joining me in that again at times when we feel overwhelmed or just any point in the day we can use this as a chance to check back in with our bodies i took a few minutes to do so you could do so even just in a matter of seconds again to check in with your breath and focus on slowing it down a bit and reconnect As we mentioned at the beginning of this snapshot, this is all in connection to compassion resilience. Each one of these sessions is building on our compassion resilience. I just wanna take a moment to define what I mean by compassion resilience for you. I feel that this is the power to return to a position of empathy, strength, and hope. After the daily witnessing of the challenges others face in our community and in our homes. So it's, when we experience all the struggles that we have out in the world around us, all the negative things that we ourselves experience, our loved ones experience, our community experiences, our building up of our compassion resilience skills helps us return to this position of empathy, strength, and hope quicker and quicker. It helps us remain optimistic in this oh so imperfect world. Something challenging to do and nothing that anyone ever perfects but rather one of those things that we're always working on and always seeing how we can build upon and enhance. And that's what the skills that we'll focus on in these series is all about. I'm in session number four of our snapshot already. You can see the rest of the content that's already been covered and is planned for now between now and August. I encourage you, if you haven't checked out sessions January, February, and March, and you're interested, you can go onto the Wisconsin Facets website and register and they'll send you a link right away or even it pops up right away that you can watch the, the short video that's connected to that piece. And if you're interested in any of the content coming up in the future, I encourage you to register so you can join us live, <clears throat> excuse me, or get the link afterwards as well to view it on your own time. Today, I'm gonna be focusing on this locus of control piece. <clears throat> excuse me. Control, it's a beautiful thing, right? And one example, little control over losing my voice in the moment there. <laughs> so today it's really looking at what kind of things are gonna be, or do, do we contribute to our compassion fatigue and leave us feeling drained? Where do we have some level of control of those things? And how and the way in which we interact with them, respond to them, can we either do something about them or look at how we can let them go if that's what serves us best? and how all of these things, taking a moment to pause and see what they are, and then seeing how we can address them or do anything moving forward, can be one of those skills to contribute to building our compassion resilience. Before I jump into an activity, and yes, this is gonna be pretty interactive, I'm gonna ask you to follow along with me, if you can. I just want to revisit one more time our compassion fatigue cycle you've seen any of our prior sessions, you've seen this one before. And actually, if you'd like the full explanation on what compassion fatigue cycle entails, I encourage you to check out January's session with my colleague, Dr. Sarah Reed, where she goes into much more depth about each one of the stages. But I just bring it up here to highlight the work of Dr. Eric Gentry and to center us in the fact that compassion fatigue is used oftentimes, or I'll be using it as an umbrella term to include things like burnout, secondary trauma. And oftentimes, compassion fatigue can be summed up as feelings of depression, exhaustion, irritability, withdrawal, that leave us feeling in a, a place where we're not access our best selves. And oftentimes, this kind of irritation and not great feelings come up for people that are in helping professions, either in their professional life or their personal life, or certainly for those who serve in helping roles in both of those spaces. It's also a totally natural response to complex situations that we experience in our world. And our body may go through these different stages, perhaps even several times in a day. But in a moment, we're gonna talk a little bit about what things drive you. So I just wanted to settle us in first, what is compassion fatigue? And give you some visuals behind that. So here in a moment, I'm gonna lead you through an exercise. It's called our Drivers of Compassion, Fatigue, and Resilience. And I'm gonna ask you to participate alongside me here. So if you have a piece of scrap paper nearby, if you could grab that and a pen or pencil, 
or if you're on your computer and you would like to follow along on a Word document, that works too. Just pop one of those open. And I'm gonna have us connect to the cycle of compassion fatigue on a personal level, but then also talk a little bit about what things pull you out of that cycle of fatigue and drive your resilience, leave you feeling filled up, excited and full. First, to start with a little bit more heavy stuff. So on one side of your paper, I want you to write fatigue. And under that side of your paper or on your Word document, I want you to list out anything that leaves you feeling drained. This could be in your personal life or in your professional life or both. A couple examples from my experience to get you thinking. I, as mentioned in the beginning, I'm a mom of a toddler, a three-year-old, three and a half-year-old to be exact. And she, just like many three and a half year olds, has very strong emotions at times. When she does tantrums, as she does, she feels like more regularly than I would like, definitely something that leaves me feeling fatigued and drained. Also, health concerns in my loved ones is another one that leaves me feeling drained. Some professional examples include being understaffed at work, not feeling like we have enough people power to support all of the opportunities and projects that we've got available to us. And then coupled with that, sometimes doing work outside the scope of my position in order to make up for some of the gaps that may be present. And then on a big picture, kind of systemic lens, one thing that drives my fatigue is the broader concept or um, practice of oppression. I mean this at a systemic level, individual level, all the ways in which people are not treated the way that they need or should be treated in our society and some of the inequities that exist. These things leave me feeling crummy, drained, sometimes hopeless. I'm going to pause here for a few more seconds and let you complete your list of things that you would have under your drivers of fatigue. Perhaps you've got a good list going so far. You may be able to come up with more. Feel free to add more if you think of them as we go to our other side. So on the other side of the paper, perhaps below it on the Word doc, or you've got a table already set up in there, the second side, would that be of resilience? What kind of things leave you feeling filled up, filled up, excited, rejuvenated? In your everyday personal, or professional or both lives, do you feel a high level of satisfaction and excitement? I want you to jot down some of those ideas. Some examples to get you started from my list. My daughter's belly laugh. I love it. It is definitely something that fills me up. Being outside, particularly on warmer days, can leave me feeling rejuvenated and um, energized. My supportive coworkers, something that brings me joy during the work day. And also seeing my personal values connected to the work that I'm doing also build my resilience. So again, I'm going to pause and let you complete your own list. Hopefully you've got a good list started there as well. Feel free to continue to add if additional things come up. The next part of this exercise is having us look at where do we have control and where do we not have control? So I want you to think about in the next two weeks, let's say, which things on your list do you feel you have control over? For those items, I want you to either bold them if you're in a Word document or circle them if you've got a piece of paper in front of you. Coupled with this is the reverse side of it. 
which things on your list do you feel you do not have control over in the next two weeks? For those items, feel free to strike them out. If you're kind of on the fence about any of the things, I eh, got a little bit of control here or there perhaps, and you're having a hard time deciding which way to go, feel free to find a middle ground. It could be a dotted circle if you're on paper, or a dotted dash out, or even italicizing uh, things if you're on your Word document. Again, to give you a visual of what this looks like for me, my top three items of fatigue, I, I don't feel I have control over. Some would argue, myself included, that at times I probably have some control over my daughter's tantrums. But at the end of the day, it doesn't feel like it, so I cross that off. Certainly the health concerns of my loved ones, I don't have control over. Being understaffed at work is not something I have control over. Doing projects outside the scope of my work, however, is something I feel I have control over. I could set boundaries with my supervisor and help brainstorm other ways to accomplish the things that need to get accomplished that help me can stay in my lane and build my resilience. And depression is one I put in italics. I feel as an uh, individual with the identities that I have as a white woman, heterosexual person, that there are times in which I have some level of power that I could do and hope to do some things to address oppression in our world. And yet, when I look at the big, big picture of oppression, sometimes at, at a big level, I don't feel like I have as much control. So there's kind of a middle ground for me. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. On my list of fatigue, or excuse me, of resilience on the other side, my daughter's laugh. I feel like some of the times, depending on what I could do, I could contribute to her ability to have that belly laugh. So I have some control. Certainly my ability to get outside and be in nature is something I have control over. I have a little bit of control when it comes to my colleagues and his supportive coworkers and the way in which I treat them. Help support, of course, them being supportive of me. And I'd say also just the line of work that I choose and the culture I choose to work in. And seeing my personal values connected to my work is something I feel I have control over, both in the, the role in which I choose to work in, but just the perspective I have in the way in which I interact with my work and present my work. So again, I'm gonna just pause for another moment and let you finish coding the things on your list. Another piece of this exercise you could consider is putting an S next to things that you could have some more control around with the support of others. Those may go naturally next to the things that are italicized or have a dotted circle around them, but could be another thing for you to think about how could I have a little bit more control with the support of others in my life or those that I may seek support from in, in my workspace, my leadership, for example. After you finish coding, I just want you to take a step back and look at your full list. As you look at your list, I want you to think about in your typical day, whatever that means nowadays, but your typical day, how much energy do you spend on things that are crossed off your list? How much energy do you put towards things that you do not have control over, or you feel you do not have control over? Go ahead and either take a, a mental note of that percentage or write it down on your piece of paper or in your Word document. Now I want you to think about how much, what percentage of your day and your typical day would be helpful for you to spend focusing on things that are outside your control. I'm a firm believer that validation is an important part of one's process. So I would argue that no one should have 0% of the time spent thinking or putting energy towards something that leaves them feeling drained. It can be validating to have a moment to process it, to vent about it. But there's typically a line, a line that after we've reached it, it's no longer helpful for us to put energy towards this piece. After that point, it's not changing the, the item that's, that we don't feel we have control over. 
If anything, it's just continuing to bring us down. And it's about finding that line. So look at your two percentages and see, is there a difference between how much time you spend now putting energy towards things you don't have control over and how much do you think would be beneficial? Oftentimes, myself included, there's a little gap, sometimes not so little, but a gap between those two places. And once we've kind of decided on, you know what, that five, 10, 15% of my day is what feels right to me, we can increase our self-awareness around this. And once we've started to put more than that percentage that we kind of told ourselves was healthy, we can help shift our perspective. So for example, as my daughter is having tantrums um, and I am working with her to try to help her calm down and recenter, the more energy I'm putting into this, I stress before she has the tantrum, during, after, what could I be doing differently? And ultimately not making a huge change in her behavior, that extra energy I'm putting into it isn't going to change anything but leave me feeling more worried and stressed about this pending behavior. So instead I can direct it towards something that I feel I do have more control over. For example, the humor that I help bring to her life and bring her joy in seeing her laugh. All about how do we shift that energy and perspective which we're, we're using to inter engage with these pieces. When we are able to put energy towards things that we feel we do have control over, even if they're drivers of fatigue, it can help build our resilience because we are more likely to see the outcomes of our work when we direct our attention towards things we have control over than not. And when we see outcomes, it helps refuel us. Another piece I want you to think about in relation to this is around a time that you feel most alive. So I'm gonna ask you to take another moment here to pause with me and think about when do you feel most alive, most like yourself? What kind of things are you doing? Who, if anyone, are you surrounding yourself with? you bring that example to mind first of all I want to make sure that's on your drivers of resilience list if it's not there already you should add it it's clearly a time when you feel your best self but also want to point out and oftentimes when I ask that question of a group of professionals and then I ask them afterwards if what naturally came to mind was a time at work 90 to 95 percent of the time people don't naturally think of a time when they're at work as when they felt most alive and most like themselves and this just begs the question of then what does it mean about how how much our co-workers get to see of us if they don't get to see us when we feel most alive there's a piece of us that they don't get to know and so how can we incorporate in our day with those that we interact with on a regular basis to share a little bit about that part of ourself with them? They get to see some of that excitement. But also for have us to think about what could this mean about times throughout our day that we do feel excited about, even if it's not what naturally came top of mind when we thought of what feels helps us feel most alive. I'm sure in our work day, we would find something that helps us leave us feeling um, alive and excited? And how do we make space and emphasize that throughout our time and talking with colleagues and after work as well? I'd say I can think of plenty of times if I'm connecting this to a personal space as well, the home life, that once in a rut, given all the things we've got on our to-do lists and responsibilities we have to fulfill in our personal lives, that there's times even in those spaces, we don't get to do things where we feel most alive. And our loved ones don't get to see that side of us. And what does that mean about our connection with them and our ability to feel on a deeper level? So again, as similarly as I mentioned about the professional life, how do you in your personal life also make opportunities for your loved ones to see you in that state? And if not to see you in real time in that state, how do you share pieces about it when you have conversations and you're reflecting on experiences? Also to think about the way in which we share things with our, our loved ones, our friends after our long days, whether they're personal long days or professional long days. 
it's kind of our natural tendency as humans to focus on all the tough stuff, all the things that was hard, that drained us, that led to that fatigue. And I challenge you to focus on at least one thing that left you feeling energized, that left you feeling alive over the course of your day. And incorporate that when you're talking with your loved ones and your friends at the end of the day about how the day went. You'll notice that incorporating that lets you relive that to an extent. And the more we feed these things, the more they grow. So that increases the sense of resiliency and wellness. It also can really help our relationships. If you've ever been on the other side of a loved one who drains, tells you all the draining things from the day, it can be hard to be fully present and supportive of that person day after day when all they bring are the challenges. It can also help our relationships if we bring in one of those, one or two of those things that left us feeling excited and joyful, deep in our connection with others. So that's one thing I'm going to ask of you as you move forward after our time together today to try tonight, tomorrow, for the rest of the week to bring up at least one thing that felt good today, one thing that left you feeling excited and just see what that feels like and the impact on your well-being. Also ask you to look at those two lists again and think about how you prioritize the items on the drivers of resilience. And I'm not saying a perfect ba balance by any means. It may be on your typical day, you've got heavy drivers of fatigue versus the drivers of resilience. I'm just saying, how can you incorporate a little bit more often some of those drivers, particularly perhaps if you've got some basic ones like getting that cup of coffee, taking a moment for a breath, stepping outside. Sometimes we forget about the positive impact that can have on us and we forget to prioritize and incorporate them. And this could be a chance for us to take a step back and work to infuse them a little bit more often. So this wraps up our talk about locus of control as it relates to compassion resilience. If here, just a reminder for us to remember the things that we have control over and remember those that we don't and spend our time focusing on all those that we do in hopes that putting our energy towards those spaces will build our compassion resilience. Thank you for being with me here today and joining me for this short snippet. If you've got any questions specifically for me, feel free to reach out to the email on the slide. So thank you, Emily. We do have one quick question, which I'm I'm sure will take more than just a quick answer, but um, just to address it. Uh, sure. The person said, I'm a person that needs to be in control of things. How do I work to let go of some of that control? Ooh, yeah, big question. And I totally empathize with. Um, I sh similarly struggle a lot when things I have a plan and a um, feel I have control over situations and then they take a drastic shift and now I no longer feel I have control and I have a hard time adjusting at times. I think one point for me that's been helpful is twofold. One, to recognize it's just going to be part of our existence, right? And I know you already know that, but just to take a moment to let ourselves pause and notice that discomfort that comes up for us when we lose a sense of control. And that's okay. That's part of being human. We see it, we feel it, and we're gonna do our best just to let it pass and accept the fact that moving forward, we, we may not have control of this situation or circumstance. Another piece to that is finding the little things that we may feel we have control over. As I mentioned in one of my examples, this idea around systemic oppression is huge. And at times when I look at it in a big picture perspective, I don't feel I have control. I don't know where to go with it. How can I narrow it in and focus on some of the smaller steps I can take along the day, along the way that I do have control over? It makes it feel less overwhelming and it makes it feel a little bit easier for me to let go of some of the control that ultimately I don't have over the bigger picture. Hopefully that's a little bit helpful. 
Well, thank you very much. We have no other questions. I would like to make one comment though. A couple of people have written that they had trouble opening up the handout. And for those people, I will definitely make sure that they get a copy of the handout and I'll send that to them after today's webinar. Uh, this will conclude our webinar for today. Again, thank you, Emily. I know that I've learned a lot today and I'm sure those that have participated will learn a lot, has lear have learned a lot as well. This um, would like to thank everybody for joining us today. Please be reminded that Wisconsin Facets has over 100 scheduled trainings and webinars for the year 2021. And please feel free to check our website calendar and register for any of those upcoming trainings that may be coming your way and that you may be interested in. Um, please also watch for the short evaluation that's coming your way after the live presentation today. Again, thank you, Emily, and thank you all for joining us today. Bye-bye now. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye now.